It's a time-honored tradition, passed down from generations. And even though we don't know what tomorrow holds, we can do our part today. To ensure the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Join today and help us ensure the future. Well, welcome to episode number 29 of Your World According to Flint. Happy to have a longtime sorta friend of mine. I get he might disagree. Okay, here's here, here's the biographical information I have. He's a seven-time NFR bull rider, Wrangler National Finals, three-time National Finals Rodeo Saddle Bronc rider. People forget about that. Three times PBR World Finals qualifier. And the current PBR Livestock Director, current, like the only PBR Livestock Director ever. And don't let the clothes fool you. Don't let the clothes fool you. He's rich. That's what I was told. <laughs> He's the one and only Cody oh. Lambert. How'd I do? How'd well, I do you got on? your information straight somewhere. That was, <laughs> that was good. It's wrong. Most that's people that's are wrong. No, that's, that's correct. Yeah, that would that be is correct. <laughs> um, do you get, as we sit here, you're the you're the, the livestock director for the last however many years it's it's kind of been your thing former vice president of the pbr but you're you're the bull guy do you still every day just get videos of bulls from people or has it settled down a little bit or picked up what's it done it's uh i'd say it's picked up i get i get three to 20 videos of bulls every day and and, and I need to, I need to see them. I need to see what they've done. But yeah. in the old days, when we started out, I had to just call people in Florida and ask them who ha who might have some decent bulls in Florida or, or call somebody I trusted in California or something like that. And, and try to get them regionally. Now everybody wants to go everywhere. Every bull's available and they're, every time one gets bucked somebody has their phone out video on them so yeah. if somebody if somebody calls me and tells me they've got a really good bull i say send me the video and they say well i don't have one i have to tell them now if he's been bucked in the Somebody's, last year in the yeah. last few years some kid had their phone out videoing him so don't give me yeah. that is it do you do you still get them from like random people you don't know that owns three bulls and this one's going to be the one or are they starting to come? I mean, do you still get that yeah. and they get your number and it's just some guy yeah. from Iowa or I yeah, actually, and it, and it, it happens all, it happens every week and somebody will say, Mr. Lambert, uh, I'd like to take this bull to Greensboro and they send me the video and sometimes they don't even put their name in there or anything, but I, I got to look at the videos because that's where you find them. And right. so in the, in, in the beginning of the PBR, we just got the best bulls we could. We'd get the best stock contractors we could, and they might, they might hold us hostage in a little, in a, a certain way saying I need to bring 20 bulls or I can't come. Right. And there's, and they've got four that you've got to have. They've got really some, They've got the the best. They they've got Playboy or something like. In those days, that's how it would be. And so, you had to find a way to deal with them. And and then as the PBR grew, it got easier in that way because, first of all, we paid better for the out money than anyone else. And then and then, second, they they wanted their bulls on TV as bad as as we needed them on TV. Yeah. And, and that's kind of, I think that's the example I've heard. I do some Q and a stuff with some riders and the riders that are really good at explaining, you know, we get a lot of questions, especially with some guys like JB now is, is rodeoing. There's been, you know, they, they ask the difference and a lot of guys explain that that's the difference when you go to a rodeo is there might be two contractors there and total, they have eight really good bulls. And then the rest of the bulls, <clears throat> and that's kind of the difference in from PBR to rodeo. There's great bulls. It's just, you don't, aren't always guaranteed to get one of those ones. That's, that's part of it. They're softer <clears throat> rodeos. I'll come right out 
say for your 6,000 viewers or whatever it is, <laughs> however, whatever the crowd is, they're, uh, as a whole, they're softer at the rodeos. That's, and, and they are the, the, the UTBs, the, the Unleash the Beast tour has the toughest bulls that there is day in and day out. A lot of them are the same, are, are some of the rodeos top bulls get to go to those things. But every time at the UTB, if you, if you ride all your bulls, you're going to win. Yeah. It's gotten that way. It's gotten that way at most rodeos too now. Yeah. Sorry, some stock contractors trying to call yeah, me. Yeah, in. see, yeah, so here's what. <laughs> Here, here's what happens there. I can tell as we're talking, I can, every time you're getting phone calls and stuff. Well, that, like was that. One, that was, yeah. And that was, was I got to tell you, that was Rick Smith. That's one of my old friends right there. <laughs> that's one of my old brown riding friends. And I, is and that's the worst, it's the worst thing ever to decline his call because is, is uh, Rick because, Smith, is that Rick Smith down in Arizona? He's in Arizona, it, but he it, grew up in Wyoming. Yeah. He's, he's married to Lynn. They're at coach. Yeah. East. I yeah. know Rick. Yeah. I'll tell him hello. when you talk to him, there you go. Um, <clears throat> I, I will say when people ask me about rodeo bulls and oh, the bulls are stronger. All I say is there's great bulls in rodeo. Cause I'm diplomatic. I'm a rodeo fan, but there's great bulls in rodeo, but and skews the, <clears throat> to the people listening. The term I use is every week at the unleash the beast tour, they're getting on Dick slammers every time like there's a difference in the power that's what i see difference in the power right and some of those bulls go to the rodeos and don't oh, yeah. get me wrong don't yeah. i'm a rodeo guy through and through but but it's just obvious that's where the difference is that's where right that's what separates the utb from everything else there's a there's good bull riders in rodeo mm -hmm. and and there's good bulls yeah but when, when they say it's the best bull riders in the world against the best bulls in the world, the only place for that is the UTB. JB Mooney, JB, who's, I've always thought JB was kind of a rodeo guy. You know, he's loving going rodeo. But reality is, and I've told fans this, he rode himself healthy through the spring going to rodeos. He packed up and went to rodeo. In a sense, he rode himself healthy Body wise and in here wise, he needed it up here probably more than anything, didn't he? JB's a JB's a legend. He's a mm -hmm. he's one of the all time greatest bull riders. Uh, there's never there's nothing that anybody can do or he can do to to change that. He's one of the all time greats, and he's in the later years of his career, and he's he's still really good, but he's not as good as he once was, and he. His he is a guy that gets up early in the mornings and likes to stay busy all day, and it fits the rodeo trail fits him to a T. The traveling, the driving, the every bit of it fits him very well because and the staying and the going in the RV and yeah. and hooking up and hooking up and having his family there and staying and going and getting groceries just because JB likes to stay busy. JB's not lazy. And a, and a lot of a lot of guys could fly to the event, lay in the hotel room all day, and still come out firing. And it's better for JB to have a to have a busy day. And then he did he does like to ride a lot of bulls, and he did he did ride himself healthy. But he wasn't going to do that on the UTB tour right. because as you're talking about the bulls he did get on 10 of them this year and he was old for 10. Yeah. Well, that's what people ask me. <clears throat> why, why JB quit the PBR? He said, well, in two months of the season, he didn't ride a bull. And that's not, and, a, but, that's just a fact. But that, yeah. And, and he's always got a chance. He's so, he's so yeah. good. He's so good. that There's <laughs> always a chance, but the rodeo deal fits him better. And I'm so glad to see it. I'm glad that, uh, well, him and I talked about it uh, at the end of last year, and I was hoping that he would go rodeoing while he still could because he was he was planning on it. To, and I was hoping that he would while he still could. But he was at that time. He said, "I want to make both finals," and I was I was hoping that he'd just go make the NFR 
and and get after it. I'm proud of his PBR career. I think he'll always be a PBR legend, and I know he will. And he's the, he's a bull riding legend. But yeah, but big, he's big just he's just where he's at. Big misconception, and I've tried to explain this to people. I there's this little thing of ha ha. JB went rodeo and. I don't think people realize all of us that go to PBRs every week, we are, we're JB fans and we watch him in rodeo and are happy for him in rodeo. I, I, I get some of that with that. They think JB sticking it to PBR and that's really not the case at all. We're, we're loving having JB. I can't wait to watch him oh, at the NFR. Oh yeah. And we're <laughs> rodeo guys too. That's the thing is, you know, my, my favorite cowboy out there rodeoing right now is Stetson Wright and me too yeah and it's and it's just so, he's so so fun to watch but he's so fun to watch but Sage Kimsey is riding so well this year and so consistent that Stetson's Stetson has to has to be as good as he is and even better to win the championship in the bull riding just like he does in the bronc riding against his brother Ryder and Brody Crest he's they, and and some other guys too, but they're gonna have they're making each other better yeah. on the trail like that. And and uh, I'm not anti rodeo in any way, but but I'll I'll uh, not hide the fact that the bulls are tougher. The but that's what separates the UTB the PBR's elite tour from everything else is yeah you get challenged with a, with a different kind of opponent every day. Mm -hmm. I, I like that you bring up Stetson, right? You, you know, at the NFR people were bringing up, uh, well, Stetson, how's he going to hold up two events 10 nights in a row? And Stetson said, it's what I do all year long. If I'm only in one event that screws me up worse than, than doing two that that's his consistent routine you know, he told me I get to the NFR. I better be in two events because that's my routine all year long. I mean, he gets, those guys are he said, cowboys. They're cowboys. Yeah, absolutely. The whole group of them, and they and they're not afraid to win. But Stetson gets me excited because he, I remember working two events and stuff like that, and and not at, not to his level, but I actually made the NFR in two events. But Stetson says he gets to have twice the fun it's twice the fun <laughs> because he loves his job yeah, and that's yeah. how and that's how ty murray approached it ty didn't mm -hmm. care which event it was he was he was in three events and that's and that's why i always go back to ty's toughness and stuff like that and i i tell him you know you watch these bareback riders about the eighth round seventh or eighth round they can barely walk out of the arena Ty was sprinting out of the arena because he had to put his saddle on a bronc. And, and then when he got off that bronc, he's sprinting out of the arena because he had to throw his rope on a bull and go win them all. That's uh, Larry Mahan has told me publicly, you know, on one of my shows that, that he, the all around championship as a rough stock guy shouldn't even be in the same category as the all around title for a roper that, I mean, he was really outspoken, like, Baloney. He said, I don't care what anybody says. If you're an all around guy and do a rough stock, that's a whole different, that's a whole different level of tough and endurance and a true all around cowboy. It, it is to an extent, the roping, the roping and, and mm -hmm. that all of the timed events are just as hard as the rough stock events. Mm -hmm. But the difference is they're not dangerous. And, and so I, I experienced some of that because I really got to roping calves a lot after I turned 50. That got to be my, I, my, uh, addiction really. Yeah. I, I, and I could compete as a calf roper and my, and I wasn't smooth and I didn't have all those years of practice and that great muscle memory, but I remembered what it was like to think you can win just because you can try harder than everyone else or just, because you think you're a little tougher than everyone else. And the rough stock events are that way to an extent that, and the calf roping room, the, the calf roping reminded me of that. And so that I watch, I, a lot of steer wrestlers stay here and, and uh, I watch them practice and see how hard they work and how physical they are. And though theirs is 
close to the rough stock events. But it's it's like if they finished that bulldogging run and then had to get up and fight Will Loomis, then it would be <laughs> like it would they get up and fight each other after they after they <laughs> throw that spear. Then it would remind you yeah. a little. It would be a little because it then it would get really scary because those guys are so tough. Yeah, and so that's the difference is the fear factor. I think yeah. the phys, the physicality of it. Those guys are so good in the timed events now. They've got they've made it where it's it's a physical. They got to be in the gym and they've got to be fit and they've got to be strong and they've got to be prepared. But uh, the bulldog and steer or the calf you rope is is not going to maul you. I saw one. I was in Australia once though, and there was a bulldog and steer that the guy had to hold him down and then take off running because one of them was really mean at this rodeo I was at, it was hilarious. So, okay. And, that, all- and that, that's fun. But those guys, the, those guys are so tough that if they just, <laughs> they, if they wouldn't take off running that steer, they just grab him and throw him down again. If they yeah. Wanted. Okay. All those steer wrestlers that stay at your house or pass through or whatever, who uh, for rodeo people listening, bull riding fans won't get, who do you think when you say somebody could, if they fought will Loomis is tough, some of them are really nice and probably don't fight. Who would you take? Uh, so Dakota Eldridge is a really good all around guy. He calf oh, yeah, dogs, but I don't know. Oh, would I, you, would you take Dakota it, Eldridge in your, on your fighting team? What do you think? Uh, his hands, all of them's hands are big enough to cover my whole fist. So I'm, I want to make sure everyone understands they could all take me and, <laughs> Not a good scale. <laughs> so, so I think, well, I'll, I'll tell a story. Dakota and Luke, Dakota was throwing some steers out of the chute, trying to break some in that they had leased for practice cattle for the winter. They were staying here and Dakota was throwing them out of the chute, uh, chute dog in them. And, and, uh, Luke was, it was cold. Luke Branquino, Luke right? Luke yeah, Branquino. Too, yeah, Luke Branquino is too cold for Luke to practice, so he's coaching Dakota, and Dakota was was throwing these steers, and one of them was so bad Dakota couldn't get him down, couldn't. And this steer was tough, and he was big, and then he got away, and he jumped and kicked Dakota right in the chest with both back feet. This was a mean, big, wild steer, and he kicked Dakota, and Dakota he bounces up and his face turns beet red and he just jumps over the the uh bulldog and shoot he just he never touched it with a hand he jumped over it and loaded another steer and i said and i said to luke i said do you realize how hard he could hit us right now if he wanted to because he was so that's the only time i've ever seen him lose his temper but when he did lose his temper there i would have uh i would have took him against anyone yeah, but the whole key to that story was you don't take Luke Branquino, who's one of the greatest bulldoggers of all time, because it was too cold for him to practice. What does that yeah. say? Well, hey, yeah. California too- guy. <laughs> yeah. It was too, yeah. Uh, I was, I, yeah. And Luke and Luke's too nice, too. Yeah. But they're well, all, he's nice. But they're yeah. all really but they're all really nice. It's hard to say. Um Tanner Milan seems pretty tough to me. You know, and He's not, Canadian, and, but Canadians. but Hunter Cure, Hunter Cure is a badass too. So, <laughs> and and uh, and then uh, I saw uh, the rodeo clown uh, Justin Rumpf. Justin Rumper. I saw him try to wrestle with Trevor Knowles one time, and mm. it didn't. And so all yeah. of them, are, all of them are really tough, and it's be hard to say yeah. because. They're not, it's not like the old days when they used to fight because there was a, there was a pecking order because they used to fight. When I first came around, everybody knew the pecking order because everybody had seen everybody fight. Who, somebody from down South was really tough. Um, there was a couple that I yeah, had Roy heard. Duvall. Roy Duvall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Roy Duvall hadn't been that. Well, I never saw Roy Duvall because he's so nice and everybody loved him, but nobody's going to ever mess with Roy <laughs> Duvall because when he was younger, he, when he was younger, he proved it. Yeah. 
Oh, geez. You know, you talk about all those guys <clears throat> coming through your place. My previous episode, episode number 28, was with Jess Lockwood, two-time world champion. He decided, I, I, some people faulted him, but I was very impressed that at 18 years old, he loaded up. And I mean, he's not really from a town. He's from a ranch and there's no town out there. He loaded up at 18 years old, moved to your place for a while. Did you, yeah, he did. It, he, did you teach him more about bull? Riding? He, it, it, I'll ask you the question and tell you what he said. Did you teach him more about bull riding or more about just life and maneuvering through life? I, I knew his dad, I knew Ed and, uh, I, I tried not to be, try to pretend to be his dad or, or his role model in that way. But, but he had to, he saw what we do every day. So he had to see that kind of thing. But as far as, uh, bull riding went, he was already good, but bull riding is, he was good at a high school level and and the touring pro level. He was starting to win a little money in the PBR, but he made the short go at 12 events and had not ridden a bull in the short go yet. And I just tried to explain to him that the riding is just the same. The riding, except when they buck better, you've just got to do it better. You still do it the same. You just got to do it better. And so... I tried to get that through to him that he had the ability. I, we worked on the mental game. We always work on the mental game more than the physical game because you can't practice bull riding that much like that. So yeah. you've got to, you've got to be right. You've got to be right there and, and prepared to win. So I, I, I think I, you know, tried to, I think I taught him more about riding than I did about, living but we he was here for two years so he saw yeah. how how we do things around well here. i think it was ty i think i probably took it i've heard it more time but i think it was hit home i think ty murray's one said i heard him say really there's not that many fundamentals in bull riding there's not that many things you just have to do them right and do them well right does that make and sense? Do them on, and, yeah, and do them on time and do them right and do them well and do them right now. Because I always try to explain to people, bull riding, if you're in time and you're in rhythm and things are going, it's like a dance. It's, mm -hmm. it's like you're with, you're with that bull and, you're, and it's like a dance. But in the middle of the dance, a fight breaks out. You better be ready to throw down. Yeah. Well, that's – and uh, speaking of that, Ty, used, Ty told me the thing about riding a bull – we were talking about the difference in bull riding and bareback riding in the in rodeo. People think bull riding is so hard on the body. And he said, bull ride, you mean 92 points in the bull ride and you step off and you feel great. And you've got that sweet spot and it's this dance. And he said, you just feel great in the bareback ride. And you can make the greatest bareback ride of your life and the high score of your life. And it still beats the crap out of you. It's just yeah. the worst. So bull riding, riding is yeah. It is, bareback riding is that fight from the time the gate opens. It's that's that's the way it is. And the bull riding can be, it can go either way. A lot of guys ride with more of a fight style, and one, others ride with more of a dance style. But but you you better have both if you're going to make it in the PBR. Yeah. Why why were some people such such idiots about the reaction to Jess going and staying at? your house and getting help from you. Why do we, uh, I'm not going to say we, cause I don't, well, why do so many fans, they want cowboys should make more money. Cowboys are professional athletes. Cowboys are this, but when a cowboy does make money or goes and uses the resources like yourself available, why do, are they then sellouts or, Oh, Cody Lambert's little boy, or I just thought the reaction to it. I mean, there's not one rider on the tour that couldn't do the same thing and go stay at the year house. You would do the same thing for every single one of them. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, any of them that ask one of the kids that's in the top 15 rodeo on right now, Kai Hamilton lives here and, and Stetson, right. Kai and Stetson rodeo together. So Stetson spent the month before the NFR last year here. We, 
we do this. We this is our life. We love it. But I don't know why the guys would think that way. Uh, um, when when Ty and I were rodeoing together, we decided that it would make more sense to rodeo in which he'd win the all around every year. So he had a long van that that he would get. And so if we hired a driver to drive us, we could sleep from midnight and I'd get up about 7 a.m. and I'd take my shift and then Ty would get up and take his shift and our driver would sleep. And it made sense for us that because we were fresh and we were ready to fire when we got to the next rodeo. People started complaining about that. Well, they've got to drive. They've got to drive. Well, yeah. If you guys wanted to win an extra hundred thousand a year, you should maybe spend the fifty bucks a day too, like we were. <laughs> Why? I, I guess I I've always wondered about. It, it's just the what cowboys are supposed to be like or supposed to do. But I guess I don't <clears throat> understand why more young riders or even veteran riders don't take advantage of resources, whether it's you or, I mean, you, you out of the picture, anyone, why don't they take advantage of mentors or coaches or the resource? Why don't guys, more guys do that? I mean, I, I think of guys in the PBR right now in my, I don't know if I should say, I thinking of certain guys. Okay. I'll say guys that I see lots of talent but they're really up and down. And if they just spent some time consistently with someone, I think they could be great. I'm thinking the faces that pop in my head, Mason Taylor, Ezekiel Mitchell right now. Um, I mean, I could, there's a bunch of them, those two guys, cause I really like those two and they really can do great things at certain times. Why don't guys take advantage of that? Their, their world. And Mason has been a little bit here lately, but, yeah. but they are world-class talents that, get in their own way and because because they grew up in a time when there's so many distractions and there's so much noise out there and then and there's there's you could we could talk about this all day you fall off a bull and you get back to the buck and shoots there's 10 guys there that are trying to tell you that it's not your fault that he had a yeah. weird day that he did something it's not you they're trying to make excuses with you because they're the excuse makers and they want you to join their club. It's and I call it the loser club. There's more losers on the back of the shoots that want to help you get over this bad feeling that you got because you just didn't do your job. And they want to tell you that it's okay and they want to give you a hug and they're the everybody gets a trophy, uh, kind of <laughs> deal like that. Yeah, yeah. And and those people outnumber the focused winners. And and I've learned this more as I got older. I learned. Yeah, because I, I, I figured out why I couldn't get, when I could get to a, a high level, a very high level, but all my traveling partners, every one of them was world champions. Every one of them wound up, every one of my traveling partners wound up being world champions. Not when we started, but when they got, mm -hmm. they wound up being world champions. And so I, I didn't kill their confidence and I didn't hurt them, you know, it hurt we because we talked about, riding and we talked about stuff mm -hmm. but so i didn't mess them up in any way so i learned that maybe i'm a better cheerleader and a better and a better uh if you want to call it coach or whatever but i learned that they have a level of focus the champions have a level of focus that everybody else doesn't have they've got a level that it makes them better and they they don't accept failure because they don't even see a chance of failure. They they are they are different than they are different than the rest of us. And I see that in every world champion when that, when Luke Branquino stays here and stuff, and we get to talking, and he's all nice and everything. And then when he's talking about steer wrestling with Tucker Allen or one of those young guys that's that's traveling with him, he travels with young guys every run there's a particular thing that he sees there that, yeah, that's good. You're good. It's, he keeps it positive, but he explains how they could get better. And the champions always are thinking how they can get better and how they can do it better. Look at, I always look at the two guys in the PBR 
that are very polar polarizing in my, in the last few years for one, because they're winners <laughs> for some, you know, guys, guys that are mediocre, aren't polarizing. You don't either love or love them or hate them because they're none to love or hate, but the great ones are polarizing. And the two guys that took the most heat for a camera following them down the hallway and throwing their ropes and kicking stuff, JB Mooney and Jess Lockwood. And the re they hate, I always say to fans, what is wrong with hating to lose? You know, they hate to lose. Joe Beaver has told me story of he'd be coming down the alley and a bull rope would fly by his, by his head and he'd hear somebody cussing and he'd go, I knew it was tough. Eat him every time. Yeah, if, if tough got, if tough got bucked off, you, you waited till he was ahead of you. Like at the NFR, if he got bucked <laughs> off, you didn't go to the locker room first because you're going to get hit with a bail or a spur or whatever he's going to throw or whatever he's going to break. So you wait till he goes and you walk behind him and then you can laugh at him the whole way, you know, laugh at how stupid, <laughs> laugh at how stupid that looks, but he meant it. I, so I yeah. tell you, he that tough was that, that kind of focused and he had to win that bad. He bucks off at Las Vegas at Thomas and Mac, not the NFR at the Hell Dorado right. days rodeo. He bucks off 88 of, of Kirby's the bull that he rode in the 10th round, the first year he won the world. But earlier that year, 88 of Kirby's bucks him off right at the whistle. And we go back in the locker room, and it's the same NFR locker room there. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I look down, and the, and the shank of tough spur was broken completely off. He, he So he's basically had one spur. And I said, tough, that probably didn't help you any. He said, no, but I did that after. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he kicked the chute so hard, he broke his spur. Broke his spur. And, and so uh, he got on Wolfman one time and Wolfman bucked him off and he gritted his teeth so hard he broke his tooth. He broke his, he got out with the, without one front tooth. And, <laughs> and we said, did he hit you in the mouth? No, he didn't. He was so mad. <laughs> he was so uh, mad he hurt himself. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked, there was a moment last winter, I think. That that uh, Derek Kolbaba kicked the Monster Energy cooler and threw some stuff, and he took that video and posted it of himself on social media, as if to say, "I know what I did." And fans, oh look at you, you, you know, cussed him. And I loved that to see Derek Kolbaba pissed off. Like, there's another yeah. guy that the, I've always called him the most streaky bull rider I've ever seen. Good or he'll he'll go one for eighteen and then ride twelve in a row, because he's just so talented, but he's just the nicest guy in the world. I mean, I'm not here to pick apart, you know, different traits of certain guys, but you just see it, you know. There's just so much talent out there, and if they could just get it all in the right direction, you know. Yeah, and then you can't take that throwing a fit too far either. Oh no, no, not at all. I remember the first year the NFR was in Las Vegas. Uh, I bucked off a couple bulls in a row and I stomped out of the arena and I was uh, going down the hallway trying to act like that and uh, Dave Appleton came and stopped me and Dave and Dave and I are real good friends and and Dave was just the messenger Bud Monroe told him to come tell me this but Bud wouldn't do it himself because I was too mad and Bud said Cody, instead of throwing that fit like that after you get bucked off, why don't you just ride that bull? Use that energy that you still got left and yeah. ride that bull. And and I said, and then so I cussed at Dave and I said, yeah, you tell Bud to come tell me that itself. And then that night I slept on it and I thought, you know what? That's a, that's a really good point there. Don't focus on your end zone dance or the fit you're going to throw when you lose too much because – you need to, you, it, uh, what I told, and comes back to what I tell Jess all the time. It starts and ends with your riding. If, if you can't do that, then the other stuff doesn't matter. Your endorsements will go away. Nobody wants to talk to you. So yeah. you, the riding, the riding is definitely more important than how mad you get when you fail. Well, you know, fans talk about 
that's been a uh, that creates something polarizing and creates reactions from fans because they you know there's this image every no matter how you do in the arena cowboys are supposed to tip their hat and smile and hug their mom and but Jerome, well, Cord, Jerome, Cord McCoy did it. Cord yeah. McCoy would ride two seconds and get up with the biggest smile on his yeah. face. Just piss me off every day because <laughs> I, how could somebody be that happy when they yeah. suck? And he said, uh, and I asked him one time, he said, I love my job. I said, well, then do your job. <laughs> uh, well, Jerome Robinson, who, <clears throat> you know, made it to the NFR 15 times, whatever. And he's 11. for, for was 11. To, was it 11? I exaggerate, but for people who don't know, he's on the headset in the arena in a sport coat to this day. Just what, just a legend in every way. But he always, he, he has told me, you know, we all acted like that at one time. We just didn't have cameras following us around. You know, nobody knew. So it was a little different. We acted, we acted a lot worse than that. In a lot of places. <laughs> a lot of have, places where, where there was, thing, no it's a good thing. We didn't have cameras. And back in those days, we, we would have been judged as well. Yes. Uh, you know, I think when we talk about using the resources and the focus and, and getting on track, I think in a roundabout way, the Brazilian bull riders, who, by the way, a lot of them are pretty good, um, in case you didn't, hadn't been watching, I think their bond, uh, because culturally they come to this country so they hang out together, I think in a way that benefits them because they're, that's the only, they got nothing else to do. That is what their sole focus. So when there's five or six of them, they get up in the morning and meet at the gym or get on practice bowls. In a sense, they're using the resources of each other to provide that focus and make themselves better. That's for sure. And they, and they have an ability to stay focused better because they, they speak a different language. So they're not going to be worried about what's coming on TV today or any of those sort of things like that. I've been spending a lot of time with those guys since we, this past couple of weeks, because we lost one of the young Brazilian uh, future stars. And, and uh, we've, we've been talking quite a bit and I've been, I've been spending a lot of time with those guys for the, for the last couple of weeks. And you see that you see that closeness and it's like family and it's like a village they all watch each other's kids they all uh, and and it, it's a it's a good thing to see and it reminds you of the old days when we were rodeoing together and there were lots of there you had all that time to talk to each other about what's going on you you talk about what's going on in your life too but you talk a lot about riding and you talk about a lot about preparation. So then, so then you feel like you're on, you're part of a team and you don't want to let your teammates down because it's an individual sport, but being a part of a team is the coolest part was always for me being a part of the guys I traveled with. I always felt like we were all on the same team and it, and it, it fit me better. You know, that fit me, the college right. rodeo days, the college rodeo teams, fit me better because I like being part of that team. Speaking of that, did you, what was your, <clears throat> you know, there's uh, some guys, there is a consistency to through your career, who you travel with, you know, my traveling partners. Was there, w- when you were rodeoing hard, was there a rotation of guys, you and tough travel together, you tough lane travel together. Jim Sharp was in Clint Brown. I mean, who was your kind of rotation of guys that were in the rig with you. Well, before before Tuff got his PRCA card, it was me and Dave Appleton. The first year I went to the NFR, uh, it was me and Dave Appleton. And Dave had just come over from Australia. He's going to college at Western Texas College in Snyder. I was going to I went one year to Howard College in Big Spring. Then I went to Saul Ross, and and we traveled together. Tough. And I grew up together. So we were always going to travel together when he uh, filled his permit. It started being me and Tough. And uh, and then Bart Wilkinson was a guy that, that went with us a little bit. And Lane got him with us. And Bart Bart broke his leg real bad and didn't rodeo anymore. And, and uh, 
the next in so all of 80 some of 84 it was tough lane me and donnie gay going to the canadian rodeos so oh, then, i didn't realize he was yeah he just still he, we flew yeah. with him and his we, he won the world he won the world in 84 yeah. and we went flew with him and his plane to the canadian rodeos in 84 and 85 the first donnie made the finals his last time was in 85 and so we went to those rodeos but we didn't travel together all the time with him tough lane and i and then uh in 86, Jim Sharp got his card. He traveled to get, we traveled together and 80, 86, 87. And then in 88, Ty got his, filled his permit and was going to, going to rodeo. And so I felt like I could help him more because he's working three events and I'm working two and we wouldn't go to as many rodeos as tough and lane and Jim. And so Clint Bronger got in. And so we entered the rodeos the same way, you know, a lot of, when we could travel together, but it was Ty and I from 88 on till I, till I quit. And then, and, uh, Ty was, and I still entered, I entered Ty and Chad Klein in the rodeos after I retired. I still entered Ty. I actually entered him. In, I entered Ty his in, entire career. That's, that's why no I kidding. told you, I, we got nine world championships. We got nine gold buckles. So between I, you, I entered, yeah. I entered him. I entered him in every rodeo, so I felt like I did my part. To the for even after you retired, you had you entered timer. In it. I did, and I could do a better job then because <laughs> because I could. <laughs> I he, Ty went from when I when he's rodeoing with me, we planned on going to eighty rodeos a year, and so that was our plan at the beginning of the year, and making sure we can he can work all three events, and I can work both of my. And, uh, as it, as after I retired, he could just go to 40 and still win the all around championship and win the world and the bull ride and stuff like that. He was so good. It, all he needed was to make sure he's in all three events. It, it, it came to a point where I could stay on it all day and see how everybody's entered at Phillipsburg, Kansas or, or wherever and figure out which day I, is the most likely that Ty could have all three events. And then when, when we did it like that, uh, I was a little more efficient and it was good for his career because he didn't have to go to, he didn't have to enter as many rodeos. Well, and he took care of it, it, Ty has told me, we've talked about it on here about, it, you know, he just like your story about the driver. He was one of the first guys to get an agent and got shit for that. You know, um, you entered him. He had one thing to worry about winning. Oh yeah. I can so, tell you the greatest. Yeah, I have, and that's that focus. That's that world yeah. champion focus. One time his, his, his second year, second or third year as a, as a pro, we went to window rock, Arizona was a, a pretty big fourth of July rodeo mm -hmm. at that time. And, and Sammy Andrews had it. And I, it didn't happen that often, but I left window rock and I was winning first in the, bronc riding and first in the bull riding with one performance left to go and i had also been the tie got bucked off his bull i was the only one made the whistle that day and that's the only time that ever happened to me because the guys i traveled with they always made the whistle so i right. the only time i ever got to hold all the day money so i was winning two events with one performance to go at a big fourth of july rodeo we leave and get us a room in albuquerque and we're going to fly out the next morning. Well, the next morning, Ty calls his mom and dad. And I hear him on the phone saying, well, I was setting forth in the bareback riding and, and somewhere in the bronc riding and got bucked off my bull. And he said, I don't know. What'd you do? And he looked over at me. I mean, we're traveling together. And I said, are you shitting me? I'm winning two events. And you didn't even watch because that's it. That's it. That was his focus. He didn't care. He, he wasn't. Yeah. No, it didn't concern him. And it, I know he watched me ride sometimes because we, we pulled my rope and stuff when we were, when we could help each other if, if we rode it far enough apart from each other, but he was so focused on his job that he didn't, I just thought he was an ungrateful little prick and, <laughs> It turns out 
Uh, it turns out that he was uh, the greatest champion because he was so focused and he wasn't going to let what I did or anybody else did affect his performance. I can just see him. I can see What'd you, hey, what'd you do? Hey, hey, <laughs> hey, Cleet, what, what'd you do? But I can just see him. But I told him, and, and, he, and then he was excited for me when he's telling his mom and dad. He said, then he says, hey, he, he's winning both events. <laughs> just like, <laughs> like he just found out. It, it's funny to me. I don't know funny in how way, ha ha, or frustrating to me. PBR fans, like real solid traditional PBR fans, talk about Ty Murray, such a great bull rider, such a great. I, I, I hope it's never forgotten how great that guy was. You know, he, when I was doing pro rodeos, clowning pro rodeos, caught him a little at the end of his rodeo career. Un, it, you think back now, just like the story you're telling of how good he really was. I, I think we forget that. I think it gets you lost think of the in some of the new guys. Yeah. You think of the all time greats in any event in any of them and in bareback riding, saddle bronc riding or bull riding and Ty could go toe to toe with, with every one of them. Mm -hmm. there, there wasn't one, there wasn't one, uh, there wasn't one event that he wasn't a threat to win every day. And there wasn't one bucking horse or one bull that you thought he didn't have a chance on. Yeah. And that, and his, his is good as the best in every event. I tell people all the time about it. Again, it's like almost like folklore because in 93, when he won the world championship, I was there and I was still rodeoing and I was entering him and he bucked off five bulls in 1993. All year. Yeah. All and year. He, he bucked, he bucked off five bulls and he's been on a bareback and a saddle bronc before he got on his bull. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. There's, that's, and, but, but that didn't, but that didn't look that unusual because Jim Sharp was there and, and tough Hedeman was there and they rode everything all the time too. So it wasn't the, their, their riding percentages were through the roof. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll bring this up because I know some fans watching this would want to know this. Uh, you, we've talked about it and it's Hollywood's going to Hollywood. You know, they're going to do their thing to simplify a story so that they can make a two hour movie who got screwed the worst in the movie. Eight seconds, as far as traveling partners, they had to make it a three person deal, but well, would Clyde, it be Jim, Clyde Jim Frost, Sharp, Clyde, Clyde Frost, Frost got screwed, got the, screwed worst. the worst, the worst, but then, but then it comes out and then it comes to, uh, Jim was non-existent and Jim was Jim at that time was the most dominated and when they when they made the movie in 92 jim was the most dominating bull rider in the world and but he was boring because he didn't say very much and he never got bucked off so he was kind of and he had already he had already uh been a rookie of the year and a world champion by the time that that Lane died. He'd already yeah. ridden all ten. He'd already ridden all ten bulls at the national finals, and in in eighty eight, Lane was killed in eighty nine. So Jim was a big part of the story. I mean, Jim was was right there yeah. with us all that day in Cheyenne. I mean, it was all. Yeah, he he got no he get got no recognition. I got portrayed as a different guy than what I really was. Right. Uh, and, but, but that was, you know, That's it was just, a movie. Yeah. It was a movie. And, and we told, they spent a lot of time with, with Lane's, with Lane's parents and with Kelly and with Tuff and with me. And, and then they went back and took what we told the stories that we told them that happened and made a, made a movie out of it and used a little bit of it. And, and it's a good movie. And I tell people it's 10% true. And I was going to ask what, how much 10% Clyde Frost, God screwed the worst. I, you know, I remember seeing that movie. I kind of remember where I was, you know, I was teaching school or whatever. And 
Then I got to know Clyde and Elsie very, very well. And there's not nicer people in the freaking world than those right. two. And, and like, that's not Clyde Frost. That's not, that's not him at all. And, and, and Lane thought the world of Clyde and Clyde thought the world of Lane and they had a great relationship and, and we all did. And it was, it was, yeah, it was totally different than that. That Clyde, I, that's how, but they didn't understand like uh, wanting to keep winning, you know, like they, it was probably explained to him some way about, yeah, he won the world championship and he wanted to win it again, or they wanted to do it. it so then they put it so on then the they dad. Put it, they put it on Clyde. Well, he's never satisfied with now. Not proud of his son. He couldn't have been more proud of his son that I could tell it. And, yeah. and he just, it, he's a, he's a humble, quiet, quiet guy that, was a great is it NFR bareback and saddle bronc mm-hmm. rider himself. Yeah. I, I do think that that movie opened people's eyes and made people look at rodeo a different way. I remember people coming to me saying, do guys really like ride a bull, then hop in a car and drive all night. It, I don't think people knew all that and it hit mainstream where it opened people's eyes. I think one thing it can be credited with is how people looked at rodeo will Kane, who's at Fox news. Now he was on, I had him on this show and he brought that up when he was in college, that movie came out and all his friends, it, it sparked their interest and opened their eyes to rodeo a little bit. So, I mean, there's some real positive out of that as far as the profession goes, you know, you mean, you know, will Kane? That's <laughs> I, I that's do. All I got. That's all I got. That's all you got out of the whole thought, thing. You yeah. said you knew Will Kane was on your show. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. No. Uh, uh, um, John Growney. Hey. John Growney, who <clears throat> was close with Lane, he told me one of the greatest things I've ever heard. And John Growney said it with tears in his eyes after all these years. He said, It's a shame he had to die for the rest of the world to know what a good guy he was. Yeah, that's so true that it it is and it it is and it's uh yeah we I I just wish that no the world could really known him because yeah. it, he was uh the that that kind of guy he, everybody liked him and he liked people and stuff but the competitor the the fierce competitor that he was it gets lost in those nice guys. It's like Michael Gaffney. You yeah. don't realize how tough they are. They mm-hmm. physically and mentally, how, how competitive and how tough they are. And then, and the, you know, my favorite part was still one of the favorite stories that I tell about Lane is, is if he ever did get bucked off, cause he'd ride 10 in a row, 20 in a row, get bucked off one. And that's how tough and Jim were. And, and, I, he, he would get, if he got bucked off, he was so mad. He would, he would have a smile on the outside kind of, but he was so (laughs) mad. He was so mad that it didn't matter if it was a thousand miles to the next rodeo. None of us had to drive because he's going to punish himself, but you just hope he's not, it's you're not in your car because he's going to go as fast as it'll go. I mean, I, I had a Chevy Caprice classic and he had that thing shaking so hard that, that <laughs> he's going, he's going at least 130 and just as fast as he could go for as long as he could go. And we hated the, we all hated to drive. We thought it, it was like a, it was like a contest to see who could get out of driving. So we weren't going to complain about the way he's driving. And so uh, he would drive as far and as fast as he could. And then when he finally just gave out, like he'd driven all night and he'd give out that we'd have to just say, Oh, I thought you had him. <laughs> and then he's good. He's good for another 200 miles. Yeah, he get mad again. Should have so had him. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was so uh, funny. That was, that was so funny. And then another time he got bucked off in the short go arena, a book of cotton's called which way did he go was as hard to ride as any bull and he's just a dirty eliminator and he fucked everybody off and he's and he was two thousand pounds 
and Lane was all over him, and he rode him seven and a half seconds, and it was Jim's rookie year, 1986, and Lane was from the front to the back, all everywhere, and uh, he gets him, he slams him, and, and kind of hurts him, he hit the ground so hard, because he wasn't letting go, and uh, but he, we're driving that night, and Lane said, and Jim Sharp's with us, and it's from Jim's rookie year, and he said, do you know what he told me? And he, Lane was pissed off. And I thought he was just pissed off about his riding. He's driving. He's pissed off. And he said, you know what he told me? Jim was asleep back there. And I said, what, what did he say? He said, I asked him what it looked like to him. He said, looked like he just let go. Because I was, <laughs> and Lane never let go. But that's how the Jim simplified it. Jim was so yeah. good because – you either rode him or you didn't. And if you didn't, it was your fault because yeah. you let go. That's all yeah. that's all Jim needed to know. That was all that, he knew at that time. And that's all he needed to know. That's kind of that's kind of Jim in real life. Everything is that, just black and white. Just, and that's bull riding. That's actual bull riding right there. Is, yeah. Is you either did it or you didn't. And you can talk about it for 400 miles, but you still didn't do it. Was Jim, it, it, because guys of your, our age, the consensus is Jim Sharp's the greatest bull rider ever. Is that what if you think? Car- if Jim's career, if Jim's career was 1986 to 1992, if it would only lasted six years, there'd be no debate. He'd ride 50, he averaged 50 in a row riding with, and buck off one and then ride another 50. I guarantee you that had, uh, he been that long there wouldn't be a debate yeah. about it and if he and he has good records i bet he's ridden more bulls than i bet jim sharp's ridden as many or more bulls in a row than george paul oh huh. yeah because technically what do you ride in a row at the nfr like 27 technically he rode the 10 in a row in one year but isn't there in the three years there's like 27 or something like like nine ten eight or something like that. Am yeah. I right on that? Yeah. It was something like that. Yeah. It was 27 or 28 bulls in a row at the NFR alone, but that was, that was just Jim on a regular basis. Yeah. He, he was a, I, I, I would bet his riding percentage is over 95% for those first six years that he rode. Yeah. Tufts was up there like that too. Yeah. Tufts was the same way. Yeah. Yeah. But tough, tough, Tough didn't ride 50 in a row. He rode 30 in a row. And the only one that bucked him off is the one that didn't, that drug around there and didn't really buck. But, but Jim, if, if that's the, if his career had only lasted that long, but then he had some issues with his groin and some injuries and, and, and he rode for a long time and he was just human for the rest of his career. He was a really good, he was a really good bull rider, but he wasn't the best one out there. So in, in my, you know, in, in my opinion, I always say that I think Tuff's the best because he was the, he went the longest as the best when he had, when he had to quit, when he had to quit because of the neck injury, he was in the lead in the PRCA and the PBR. Yeah. And, he, and that's, that's 14 years into a career, you know, that, yeah. so. Yeah, uh, that's why. Um, that's why I always said he was the best. Donnie Gay has the most championships, so so that could be called. You know, you could. Well, call that's that. if you ask if you ask Donnie Gay. Well, then the, he's and, the best. <laughs> but yeah, he was tell, he made an impact I was, when I was a little kid was watching there, the NFR. I was there when he was there. He could ride. I'll tell oh, you. Yeah. I'll give him that. He. You know what's interesting about Donnie Gay? To this day, right now, I'm not talking in the past. He believes in his heart right now. He could work out for two months and go ride any bull out there. He believes that right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. I, don't, I think no, he's wrong, I, but no, I'm not going to tell. He's wrong, but he's wrong. But that's but, that focus. That's that he, mentality that of it. Focus. Yeah, he, he definitely had it. He what, definitely had it. What do you see in uh, when you, because you've seen all the, all these years, seen all the best bull riders in the world. What does Jose Vitor Lemay look like to you? He's, he looks like he's got a chance to be the best there's ever been. 
that there's uh, a couple technical things, just a couple fundamental things in his riding that he could get better at. And that's all his every day. He does the right thing, says the right things. He's he loves his job and he wants to be there. You remember how good the bull riding was at Cheyenne? Oh, the, the last yeah. cowboy standing at Cheyenne. Oh my God. That was yeah. just, that was <clears throat> just what it is. That was Jose. And then after it was over, Jerome Robinson and I, and, and Boudreau did a really good job too and got second. But when we walked out of the arena, Jerome Robinson and I were talking and we decided that's what it looks like when guys really want to be there. And, yeah. and Jose, he wants to be there. And that he's, he's got, he's, he's a, a freak athlete like Ty or, or one of those guys, different, but total different body style, total different riding style. Like, but he's got like a Jim Sharp mentality where he's not going to let those bulls get him. And he just not, he's not going to let them buck him off. And um, well, I'll, I, I'll, I will say, cause I don't know if you know that I've been, you know, all the debates of best ride you've ever seen. I've been there for most of those too. And his ride on Wupa at Tulsa moved in. That's the greatest bull ride I've ever seen. And I didn't know. And then I, uh, on my uh, Facebook live thing, I had a, a arena level video that uh, Katie, who, who kind of owns the bull, Katie, per, you know, um, had posted an arena level. That's the greatest ride I've ever seen. Like hands well, down, the greatest yeah. bull ride I've ever seen. I felt like I felt like it was exactly the same ride as he made at the world finals, but this time the judges got the score right. And oh, look, good point. Look, so those are it's not even the just the best ride; it's the best ride and the second best ride. I yeah. think both of I think they, I think they definitely got it right on that one. And uh, three judges had it forty nine. One had it forty eight and a half. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Just the way that bull. You know, I've, I've broke it down on a, yeah, I know I'm not a judge, but I've seen it on TV where that bull's front feet hit. They hit here one jump and 10 feet that way on the next jump and hit that bull's extension. That's a great bull. They can ride him, but that's a great bull. He does everything. He, he, he checks all the boxes. That's how <laughs> you te yeah. te teach scoring. He checks all the boxes. I've seen a bull buck harder than that and get rode one time. And it was when Cooper Davis rode uh, a smooth, smooth operator, operator. In, in New Jersey. Yeah. And, and, uh, but Cooper didn't have the control that Jose had on that. Well, smooth yeah. operator was a half a point better was this. I, and I teach the judging seminars mm -hmm. and stuff. And so I've always used that Cooper Davis's to show uh, how hard a bull can buck and, and all the categories that that bull would have been a 25 smooth operator would have been a 25 had he bucked Cooper off. So but oh. could he can only get 24 and a half if he got road because his number one mission was to throw that rider off. So I can't give him a hundred percent. Right. Credit. Right. You can't mark that, him perfect. If I yeah. can't mark him 25 <laughs> there and that's my, and that's how I teach the, the judging classes, yeah. but but that's one I've shown over and over. And now Jose's two rides on whoop off will definitely be some that we show as well. And, yeah. and explaining the categories, the buck, the kick, the uh, direction change, the intensity and the degree of difficulty on bulls. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, convince, convince us. Because I've, I've That's questioned too, no, on, I'm, I'm off bulls now convince, convince the fans, the fans watching and me why the new season structure of the PBR with the world finals in may, because, because I, I can kind of do it. I can explain some of it, why that's a good thing. Well, getting off the NFR, you're getting off the yep. closeness of the NFR is a good thing. And having a structured season, season that that ends like other sports do is going to be a good thing because we've got a lot more stuff to offer in the PBR and there's a lot more to come. Yeah. And so we're not, you're not going to 
suffer through the other six months of the year either. I can just tell you that. Yeah. Much. I, I think it all years. And I, I said this out loud on another deal. I do. I just, I think fans, I understand announcing this season first and Hey, wait, there's more to come, but I think we needed to let fans know what's going to happen in that other part to keep them from, to cool them down a little. I'll tell you the hardest question I answer currently on an airplane. What do you do? I tour with PBR. Oh, gee. Now what in people who aren't fans, what's your season? Do you know how hard that is to explain yeah, that yeah. we're a real sport, but we don't really have a season. And I don't think people are going to see once the adjustment is made, the season's going to start in November. It's not just right. those few months. Correct. We're going to, yeah, we're going to deliver, we're going to deliver the, a better product and every bit as much of the product as they, as we have in the past, there's going to get, they're going to get, uh, they're going to get to see a lot of stuff, but if we don't, if we don't make moves and take chances on trying to get better, then at some point we're going to get in a rut and we're just going to do the same thing over and over again, which is good, but maybe we can be even way better. It, it might be great now, but it might be so much better uh, because we were willing to, to risk some stuff and take yeah. chances. And Jim Hayworth, who, who was the CEO mm -hmm. at one time of the PBR, I was telling Jim, I said, we try a lot of stuff in the PBR when he first came on. I said, we try a lot of stuff and, and everything we've done hasn't worked, but lots of things we've done has worked. And Jim said, Cody, if uh, everything you do works, that just means you're not trying enough stuff. Well, I know this season thing, the season structure change, it's been, this isn't new. This has been in the works for a while to get off the NFR to have season. Here's what gets me is fans are saying, oh, what, a six-month season? A five-month? Oh, well, why Why should bull riders have to ride for 12 months, but football players don't? I mean, even if it well, is only six months, you yeah. know, it never makes sense to me. For one thing, the guys won't be sitting around the other six months. That's this is going to be a great season. It's going to give bull riders more opportunity, more options. It's going to be give fans more opportunity and more options. And we're going to bring we're going to bring some stuff that a lot of people haven't thought about yet. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's great things ahead. I'll let you go. Great stories, Cody Lambert. Everybody, see you next time. According to Flynn. 